Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. A thorough understanding of images is basic to the study of dental radiography. Today, we will explore the production and properties of images. The three ingredients which are necessary to, be, to produce images are, first, a source of radiation, secondly, an object to produce the image, and third, a screen on which the image will be cast. Today, we will demonstrate using both light and x-rays. I have a flashlight bulb, and when it's turned on, we can see it glowing brightly. This represents a point source of light. Now, from that source of light, there are rays given off, one of which will travel to my right eye, another will travel to my left eye. Now, if there were a hundred other people clustered around this light, there would be a ray of light reaching each of their two eyes. Now we turn to a slide. In the center, we have a source of radiation, and emanating from it in numerous directions are rays. They're shown here as straight lines with arrows indicating their direction. So rays go in all directions. Now I'm going to take this tiny light source and put it in this cardboard box. We put the top on and quite obviously none of the light can get out because the walls of the box are opaque. If this were an x-ray source and the box were made of lead, none of the x-rays would get out. Now on the slide, we see this same relationship. There in the center is the source of the radiation, the rays going in all directions, and they reach the walls of the container and none get outside because the walls are opaque to this form of radiation. Now turning back to our cardboard box, if I were to make an opening in the front of the box, then some of the light rays could get out. Now we'll have to darken the room so that we can see this. The aperture that we made in the wall of this cardboard box was a square opening, and so shown here in this darkened room is the image of these light rays as they reach the cardboard screen. Because the aperture was square, the image is square. Now the image is composed of just multitudes of individual rays. There is one ray that's contributing the center of this square image, and we'll honor it by giving it a name. We'll call it the central ray. Now if I wanted a beam of other than square shape, I must introduce another device called a collimator. So we'll turn on the lights and put that in place. Now, to make the beam circular in cross-section, we're going to use a device called a lead diaphragm with a circular aperture in it. Now, this is placed in the box over the square aperture, which I had made in there earlier. And now we'll darken the room, and we'll see how it's altered the beam. Now we see the circular beam cast upon the screen, produced by the circular aperture in the lead diaphragm type of collimator. Now the center of this circular pattern is caused by the ray which we have honored by calling central ray. Another way of collimating the x-ray beam is to use a second type of collimator, which we'll show you now. This is the second type of collimator. The first was the lead washer type. This is the tubular collimator. It has a circular opening all the way through, 
It's nothing more than a pipe or a tube. Now I want to fasten this to the front of my simulated x-ray machine here. There we see the square opening and I locate the tubular collimator on, onto the front of it. Now we'll turn it back so it's aiming toward the screen. Now we'll darken the room and see the result. All right, here we see the image cast upon the screen when we employ the tubular collimator. And again, the center of the beam is formed by the central ray. Now turning to the next slide, we see a diagram of the box with the light source, the aperture, and then we have the tubular collimator shown as two horizontal lines which limit the diameter of the beam. Again, the central ray occupies the center of this beam. All right, we can also filter the radiation that comes out of the box by interposing a colored piece of plastic over the aperture. So we'll take the top off the box. I have to remove the tubular collimator and the, f the filter goes in at this point. Now we'll turn off the light and we'll see the result. The square area on the screen is now illuminated with red light. The lamp emits white light, which is composed of all colors of the spectrum, but the red filter stops all but the red portion of the beam, and so we have only red light illuminating the screen. Now in x-ray work, we emit x-rays of different wavelengths. They don't have pretty names like the names of colors, but certain portions of the x-ray spectrum are not desirable and others are more desirable. And so we will utilize an x-ray filter to filter out the non-useful part of the x-ray spectrum. Now we'll turn on the lights and look at an x-ray filter. Next, I demonstrate the aluminum filter. Now instead of a colored sheet of cellophane to filter x-rays, we use a, a disc of aluminum. Now this is a half a millimeter thick. Now these things fit in the head of an x-ray machine. We must first take off the pointed cone of the apparatus. And then the filter disc fits right in here at the base of where the cone will fasten. So it will filter the rays that emerge from this box, which is the head of the x-ray machine. Now this is the cone that I'm putting on now. The white lines on the sides of the cone represent the path of the central ray. Now as we view it from the side, you can see the white line here indicating the path of the central ray. And viewed from the top, again we see the, the path of the central ray. Now another type of cone <coughs> is called the open-end cone. This one, of course, is a pointed cone, and the other one is open at the end. Now, you notice that in the base of it, it has a tubular collimator, whereas the pointed cone had the diaphragm-type collimator. Now, we'll fasten this in place on the apparatus. It has black lines printed on the sides of this, the uh, sides of the walls of this transparent cone. And we can, we can see these lines indicating the path of the central ray. Now the x-ray machine is so designed, so the weight of it is c carefully counterbalanced. And I can direct the beam upwards or downwards I'm changing the vertical angular direction, which we will contract into simply vertical angulation. In addition to that, I can direct the rays toward my right or toward my left. 
Here I'm changing the horizontal angular direction of the rays, which will contract into horizontal angulation. Next, we'll explore the basic methods of image formation. We're all familiar with the photograph. That's where we make a picture, an image, using visible light. I have a specimen here that we're going to make a picture of. It's namely a skull. Then I have a source of light, a gooseneck lamp. So we'll turn it on so that it directs its rays at the, at the skull. Then I have a screen, which is a tiny piece of plastic. Now, in this instance, the source of the light and the screen are going to be on the same side of the specimen. Now, to create photographs, we need a camera. So, of course, I have a camera here. Now, we're using reflected light. Now, I'll put the screen over the gate of the camera, and we can dimly see the image of the skull. Now we'll turn out the light so that we can see this image better. Now we're zooming in so that we can see the image more distinctly. Now you notice the image when it's reproduced in the camera is inverted. This is always the way a camera works. Now it's possible to make moving images. There my hand is in the field. And of course, they're in color as well. Now, this is an example of making an image using light which reflects off of the external surface of the object. You did not see the bones inside the hand. All you could see was the skin and external details. With other types of pictures, we'll be able to show the internal details. Now we turn to a second type of image that can be produced using visible light. Again, we require a source of radiation, an object, and a screen on which the image will be cast. Now, we'll use this skull as our object, and I'll position it in front of this screen. Then, <clears throat> I'll use this portable lamp as my source of radiation. Now, you notice the relationship between the source, object, and screen is different than it was in the photograph. There, the screen and the source are on the same side of the, of the subject, or the object, and here we have the object lying between the source and the screen. Now, when we turn off the visible light, we cast our image on the screen. Now here we, we see the silhouette of the skull. The light does not pass through the object. The object is opaque. It interrupts the radiation from reaching the screen. And so all this is doing is portraying a silhouette image of the object. Now if we had a form of radiation that had the ability to penetrate the object, then we could also fill in internal details that are lacking in this shadow graph. Now we'll make another picture of this specimen. It'll be from the same point of view that we used before, but now we'll use slightly different equipment. We'll use the same skull as before. Now this fluorescent, this screen is a different type of screen than what we've used before. This is a fluorescent screen. It's simply a piece of plastic on which is coated a certain chemical that has a unique ability to transform invisible x-ray into visible light. So when struck with x-rays, you will see an image in visible light. Now, in place of the visible light, we'll now use an x-ray source. So now I'll move it in quite closely. Now we're all set. 
I'll back out of the picture a ways. And now we'll turn off the house lights and turn on the x-rays. Now you notice that we have met the three requirements for image production. We have a source, which is the x-ray machine, the object, which is the skull, and the screen, which is now a fluorescent screen. The object, again, lies between the x-ray source and the screen. Now this time we're using a form of radiation that allows the rays to pass through the object. And so in addition to portraying the silhouette, such as the shadow graph did, we produced the silhouette plus all the internal details. Now some of the details show lighter, some darker, depending upon their ability to stop the x-rays. Cosmic rays, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays, visible light, infrared, radio waves are all members of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now we're interested only in the visible light and the x-ray portion of this broad spectrum. Now these two forms of radiation have some characteristics in common and with others they differ quite markedly. For example, both visible light and x-rays travel at the speed of light. Both travel in straight lines. They differ, however, in their penetrating ability. Visible light does a poor job of penetrating, whereas x-rays penetrate very well. Visible light does not cause ionization of tissues, whereas x-rays will do this. Visible light does not cause chemicals to fluoresce, whereas x-rays can cause fluorescence. This we have seen in the earlier demonstration with the fluorescent screen. The human eye is affected by vis visible light, and the eye sees the light. X-rays cannot be detected by the human eye. If we direct visible light at a glass prism, the light is refracted into its rainbow of colors, not so with x-rays. The prism either stops the x-rays or the x-rays pass right through the prism. Visible light can be reflected by mirrors, but x-rays cannot. X-rays either go through the mirror or are absorbed by it. Visible light can be focused by means of lenses, but x-rays cannot. They travel in straight lines right through the lens, or they're simply stopped by the lens. Both light and x-rays affect photographic films. This factor makes photography and radiography possible. Again, we would like to refer to the penetrating ability of radiation. Now to express the penetrating ability, we have to be aware of certain terms. Now we're all familiar with the terms transparent and opaque, but, op uh, but radiolucent and radiopaque are perhaps new to us. Now a transparent material has the property of transmitting light through its substance, whereas opaque material has the property of being impenetrable to light. Now, radiolucent materials have the property of being quite transparent to x-rays, whereas radiopaque materials are quite impenetrable by x-rays. Now, I'd like to demonstrate the passage of light and x-ray through four different substances, a sheet of plastic, a sheet of glass, a piece of cardboard, and a sheet of metal. Now for this, we'll have to darken the room. We have a visible light beam directed at this screen, and now I'll interpose various materials in this light beam. The first is a plate of glass. And you see, 
the light goes through it very well, and so we'd have to classify this plate of glass as being transparent. So it's transparent to visible light. Next, we turn to a sheet of, of uh, lucite plastic, and it too seems to be transparent to visible light. Next, a sheet of cardboard, and you see it is opaque to the passage of visible light. And finally, a sheet of metal, which also is opaque to the passage of light. Now we'll switch to a different form of radiation and test the same substances. So we'll need our x-ray source up close here. By keeping it close, we'll be able to produce brighter images. Now we must darken the room. We turn on the x-ray beam, and I introduce the piece of glass. And you see it stops the radiation, therefore it is radiopaque. This is leaded glass. Now we take that out of the beam and, re and replace it with the sheet of transparent plastic. So the beam is on, I introduce the plastic, and you see it is radiolucent. So it's transparent and radiolucent. Now next we go to the piece of cardboard. Now the cardboard doesn't even show. It's utterly radiolucent. And the last item is the metal. I introduce that into the beam and it turns off the radiation completely. It is radiopaque. We have seen that some of the substances are opaque to both forms of radiation whereas other substances are transparent to both forms of radiation. We have found some substances are transparent but radiopaque, whereas others are opaque and radiolucent. The usage of the terms radiolucent and radiopaque they're not used to describe the exact degree of transmission of x-rays, but instead are used in a relative or a comparative sense, much like the terms tall and short are used to describe one's height. Consider three persons, A, B, and C, whose heights are four feet, five feet, and six feet respectively. What is B's relative height? Compared to A, B is tall, but when compared to C, B is short. Height in this sense is relative, not absolute. A large percentage of the x-rays directed at soft tissue are transmitted. Therefore, soft tissue would be classified as being radiolucent compared with denser tissues such as bone. Now a small percentage of the x-rays directed at tooth enamel are transmitted. Therefore, enamel would be classified as being radiopaque compared with less dense tissues such as dentin. Bone transmits more x-radiation than does an equal thickness of enamel, but transmits less than does an equal thickness of soft tissue. Therefore, bone would be described as being more radiopaque than soft tissue and more radiolucent than enamel. Shown here is a filling, it's very radiopaque, not much radiation gets through there. And then beyond it we find a carious lesion where a tooth structure has been destroyed and it shows up darker than the surrounding tissues. The pulp chamber 
and the root canal of the tooth also show up very dark on the radiograph. Now we turn to a list of dental materials and structures that's arranged according to their relative radiolucencies and radiopacities. Now at the top of the array, we have objects that are most radiopaque, and they get progressively more radiolucent as we read downward. So of the, of the materials found in the mouth, the gold inlay would perhaps be the most radiopaque substance, followed by silver amalgam, enamel, dentin, bone, Cavities and silicates look alike on a radiograph, and soft tissue being the most radiolucent of all. When the light is held close to the screen, we illuminate a small area brilliantly. When the light is removed from the screen, the illuminated area becomes larger and dimmer. The intensity of the radiation reaching the screen is a function of distance. All right, this is called the inverse square law. The intensity of the X-ray beam varies inversely as the square of the distance. This is the mathematical expression of the inverse square law. It says intensity sub two is equal to intensity sub one multiplied by d sub one squared over d sub two squared. Now this relationship involves intensities and distances. Now in the dental office, we can measure distance, but we cannot measure intensities. So this will merely be a step along the way to something more useful. Now on the next chart, we must review some properties of similar triangles. Outlined in yellow, we have a large triangle. And then parallel to its base, we have drawn in two horizontal lines, one above the other. So in essence, we have three triangles so uh, one superimposed on top and on, on the next. Now the, the height of the large yellow triangle is D units, and its width is W. The height of the next one, slightly smaller, is D sub one units high, and W one sub units wide. And then the smallest one, D sub two units high, and W sub units two. Well, when you're dealing with similar triangles, certain relationships hold. For instance, the ratio between W sub 1 divided by D sub 1 is the same as W sub 2 divided by D sub 2, and that's equal to W over D. And this is a constant ratio. Now, if we were to rework that a little bit, we would say that W is equal to this constant ratio times D. Now we turn to our next slide. Now here we have a source of radiation up at the top. And located at a distance D sub 1 below, we have a square indicated. The sides of the square are W sub 1 on each side. Way at the bottom, at distance D sub 2 below the source, we have another square, W sub 2 uh, square. Now suppose that at the source, we had a snowmaker. Now it makes snow, and the snow comes from this source in straight lines. Now, let's say that I indicates the depth of the snow. So if we had a square uh, piece of material located D sub 1 units below the snowmaker, and we turned on the snowmaker for a brief period of time, the snow would pile up to a depth of I sub 1. Now, if this square barrier had not been in place, 
and the snow had been free to continue down to the lower square area, the same amount of snow would have fallen on the lower square area, but it would occupy a larger area. Therefore, it wouldn't be as deep, and so the depth would be I sub 2. Well, now, instead of snow, we're actually talking about radiation, and instead of depth of snow, we're talking about intensity of the radiation. Now, it's important to remember, it was the same amount of snow at each of the two square areas. It's the same amount of radiation distributed at each of the two levels. Now, in this relationship, we have two quantities that are equal. We want to measure the amount of snow at each of these two platforms. The depth of the snow, I sub 1, multiplied by the area that it covers, W sub 1 squared, equals a certain amount of snow. And that same amount of snow would be present at the lower level, and it would be of a depth I sub 2, occupying an area W sub 2 squared. Now, in core, instead of snow, think of it as radiation distributed over these two areas. It's the identical amount of radiation. Now, if we simply manipulate these terms, we can, we can uh, solve for I sub 2. Now, I sub 2 is equal to I sub 1 multiplied by the area of the top square, W sub 1 squared, divided by the area of the lower square, W sub 2 squared. But from the properties of similar triangles, we had learned that W is equal to this constant ratio times D. And so, in place of W1, we're going to uh, write constant ratio times D, D sub 1 squared, and in place of uh, W sub 2, we'll write the constant ratio times D sub 2 squared. Now we have constant ratio both in the numerator and denominator, and so we'll cancel them out. And what we're left with then is the inverse square law. All right, this is a very fine relationship, but unfortunately, the dentist has no way of measuring intensity. The length of the cone will measure distance for him. We turn to the reciprocity law. The amount of radiation necessary to produce a given radiographic image on a film is a constant and is equal to the product of intensity and time. Now to illustrate this, we've all had an opportunity to get sunburned. It takes a certain amount of exposure to radiant energy to produce this effect. This is a constant amount for a given patch of skin. Now, if we toast our epidermis on a day when the sunlight is dim, it takes a longer time before we achieve this desired result. If, on the other hand, the sunlight is brilliant, then we get burned in a much shorter length of time. In each case, have we delivered the same amount of radiation to the skin. Now we turn to this chart which illustrates this. I sub 1 and I sub 2 are the two different intensities of the radiation. T1 and T2 are the two times of exposures. Now if we rework this relationship, we end up solving for T sub 2, which is equal to T sub 1 multiplied by the fraction I sub 1 divided by I sub 2. Now on this next chart, we have this same relationship pictured in the upper left-hand corner. Now in the upper right-hand corner, in blue lettering, we have the inverse square law. Now each of these two relationships have involved intensities, and we have no way of measuring them in a dental office. The one relationship, the reciprocity law, also had time involved, which we can measure, and the inverse square law had distance in it, which we can measure. 
So now we must combine these two into a third relationship. So in place of I sub 2, we will put its equivalent. And so here is I sub 2, and here is its equivalent. And so that all fits down in the denominator here. We notice that there is I sub 1 in the numerator and I sub 1 in the denominator. So we will cancel them. And then rearranging the terms, we come to the exposure time distance law. Now here we have a relationship that involves exposure times and distances. The exposure times can be measured with the timer of the x-ray machine. The distances are measured by the length of the cone on the x-ray machine. Now this is a very useful relationship when we are changing distances when making pictures. This concludes our discussion of this part of our work. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.